Yeah. Gerald, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks. Good morning. My name, as said, is Gerald. I'm from the ÖBB, that's the Austrian Federal Railway, and I'm there in uh, a company called Business Competency Center that is the central IT provider and specialized for digital innovation. So, from the heights of the previous talk, from the future, I'm going to bring you back to what we're doing right now, what the challenges uh, are at the moment. And so I'll uh, elaborate a bit on the topic of IoT, of advanced analytics, in a company that is um, not a startup that has to deal with the processes it has in place since many years. So we cannot take a clean sheet approach. We have to deal what we have. And so I want to take you there a little bit, what we are doing, what the challenges are, and why this topic is interesting for developers. You know, uh, rail cargo is a very old business. Hauling goods through Europe is uh, done nearly the same way since decades. There are rail wagons like uh, these ones are very different in size, in uh, purpose, also in the value of the goods they are transporting. And they are rolling more or less through Europe. And until now, these were, yeah, I'd say, uh, pieces of dumped metal. We didn't know anything about these things. We didn't know where they are. We didn't know uh, how healthy they are. We didn't know what's going on. And that's not just a problem of ÖBB, it was or is a problem for all the railway providers in Europe. So the trucks and the container business uh, did a big advance. When you order something over Amazon, you uh, get very exact data where your goods are, what's going on, where they are shifted. And so we and many other railways are in the process of going also this way to do something. To do something means uh, to put some uh, sensors on these wagons to uh, collect data. Collecting data means we are interested in simple things like the GPS position, where is this wagon, the speed, the heading, some data about temperatures, pressures, um, accelerations, g-forces, and many more. And for some types of goods, it's very important for us to have these uh, sensors because, for example, when you take these uh, wagons, they are carrying so-called shims, that is steel that is used for producing cars. And the problem is that these uh, rolls of steels are very heavy. So when these are loaded not exactly, it can really damage the car uh, very fast. Yeah, when talking about these sensors, it's um, adding up an interesting world. One thing is the, these sensors are on freight wagons. Freight wagons usually have no power. So we need some way to find um, uh, power to do all the measurements. So there is a lot of developments going on. Ones are doing with battery packs, others are doing with uh, solar cells, with um, taking up the energy from the movement. So there is no real best solution right now. So all the vendors and all the suppliers are trying the best. And the second thing is connectivity. We are usually thinking of a very connected world. When we think of Internet of Things, we're, go we're thinking, yes, I have my 3, 4G, 5G connectivity like e everywhere. When you're going with rail cargo in whole Europe or even further, that suddenly can change when you're on the track somewhere in uh, rural uh, Romania or somewhere in the Ukraine. You're very happy if you have uh, uh, connectivity in the big cities and not on the track where you need it. So we are also in the way of finding ways even to get the data to our place. Yeah, but that's mainly the hardware thing. It's more or less easy, as I said, to mount these things on devices and collect the data. More or less easy is also getting a big number when you think that uh, Austrian rail cargo alone operates about 20,000 of these cars in own and even more with the leased and used cars. So the amount of data is adding up yeah, quite quickly. So once we have the data, 
unfortunately, we cannot bring a big train in here, so we have our little toy train that is uh, used for our um, demos. When we get this data, we can like start with a little warm-up, simple binary information. Yeah, very easily done. We as developer like this, like it, zeros or ones. What are we needing these sensors for? As you've seen, it can be used to detect if a door is opened or closed. Makes sense when you know that there is a big problem with crime on tracks, so it can happen that a train is standing somewhere and people are opening the doors, stealing things out of the cars and uh, going away. Or it can be used to simply detect um, technical issues, technical failures. So to make it a bit harder, it's not that easy that you just detect the zero or one. So with this car, for example, if the, if the shunt is open, in this case, it's OK. It's OK because it's a planned activity, meaning we have to know to do that. We have to know that this activity is taking place in a, where it should be, that there is, an, uh, there is a process where it should happen. So we are needing all the geographical information, we are needing the process information and all these things to detect if something that happens is happening intentionally or if it should draw up an alert. So this is yeah, like a little warm-up. Second one is we are having uh, sensors to monitor the acceleration in three axes and that one is allowing us to detect some things that usually shouldn't happen or are debatable, like uh, accidents, like um, things that happen to goods, because it's always the topic when a good arrives damaged at the receiver. The first question is who's responsible, who's going to pay for that? On the one hand, that's the short term. And also the question, how can we learn from that? Where do things happen, perhaps frequently, that are damaging goods? that are leading to unsatisfactory uh, outcomes. So in one axis, the set axis is when we are loading or offloading uh, the wagons. Usually when there is some uh, loading, you can see that the set axis is getting a quite uh, much g-forces if it happens like that one was a failed loading when uh, there was much too much force used and so the, the good really was pushed down to the wagon and all, almost bounced up again. So, and you also see that, it's, um, that you get also other access like when, if you can expect it, when you're loading the wagon, uh, not exactly in the middle, it's uh, generating acceleration to the other axis. Yeah, the second thing that can happen is um, some damage by loading, maybe loading by us or loading by the customer, as indicated uh, in work process, some uh, damages happen, and it's always the question, where did it happen? And in that case, we also can see that quite clear on the G-forces. This is what we are we called uh, telematics before we had IoT. These are very simple measures. So we have the forces, we have uh, um, boundaries or limits where we um, are raising alerts or raising concerns, what happens. So that is still the like old school, not the really new IoT school. When doing uh, shunting, for example, it is expected that the forces in the x-axis uh, are um, being measured. So it's also there starting that you need to get some information about the surrounding, about what's happening with the train right now. Because when there is shunting, it uh, can be expected there are many short movements, many brakes and many uh, accelerations that uh, generate uh, short spikes of these g-forces. If massive g-forces are uh, occurring on the track, it indicates different states like that the, there was an emergency break, that there was something happening that shouldn't happen and that uh, probably uh, destroyed the goods being on that. So that is still um, measurement being uh, applied to only one sensor or to one place. 
So another thing we can do is, or we are ac actually doing is, getting some indication about the track. The wagons, like I said, 20,000 wagons are, are driving through whole Europe. So the state of the track is influencing the wagon. If there is something like, um, you can see these uh, things, that are little damages to the rails, sometimes little damages that you almost cannot see with the eye, but um, we are detecting it with the cars. And here comes the first piece of uh, advanced analytics because um, you have not only one place, or you have one geographical place where something happens, and you have a lot of cars going over it. And all these rail cars are acting differently. We have cars with uh, two axes, cars with four axes, different kinds of suspensions, different kinds of loading. So it's not that easy anymore to give a simple limit or to give a simple uh, rule to say if this or that value is exceeded, we are detecting that there is some damage. But we're detecting it by pattern recognition. More or less, there are some wagons that are like being a good general sensor, some wagons that are being a not so good sensor. So yeah, they are detecting what's going on. So in our case, um, we see that um, different wagons, these are three types of wagons, are behaving very, very different. But on one place, there is a, a similarity that is like um, indicating that there is something going on with the tracks, meaning that we are expecting that the uh, rail is de degrading. So it's interesting for the infrastructure provider to know this information, to do preventive maintenance on the tracks, to plan uh, maintenance, to not be in the situation that there is a, a break of the rail that really blocks your way. Yeah, and a good topic, always a good topic, preventive maintenance. So with these uh, sensors, we are getting into the situation that we can start off, think of preventive maintenance. Think of preventive maintenance means that we're getting a lot of data, like uh, one wagon, depending on the type, can have eight to 10 physical sensors with 10 to 20 uh, me measuring channels. So yeah, we are probably getting a lot of information about the state, about the health, about what's going on. And we need this preventive maintenance because um, Failing wagons are a, quite a big problem in, in cargo hall because when, for example, a passenger train fails, yeah, it's okay, it's not so convenient for you as a passenger, but the next one, next train will be in half an hour or in an hour. If I'm hauling goods from uh, Greece to, for example, Sweden, this train is only uh, going once a week. So if there is a damage, we are really in big trouble. Uh, keeping our service level agreements and so on. So when that happens, like an axis is uh, indicating it's getting more and more bad, these things really need uh, deep analysis. Deep analysis on the one hand because there is no more one sense or value or one particular value that tells you that something is happening because usually if the sensor is tem telling you a problem, it's too late already, then it's really uh, already a big, big problem and may maybe bring you to a stop on the track. So, yeah, then these curves look something like that. Not telling anything specifically to the untrained eye, but if you have put some uh, methods on it, if you put some models on it, then you may indicate or may see that, oh, sorry, that uh, there is something building up. Something building up means that usually not one sensor value alone or uh, two or three of them are indicating something, but we often have the, the experience that like first this happens, then that happens, and then a third thing happens, then we know, okay, some problem is gonna come soon. Another thing that we need to address in this area is that we are not, not talking about one sensor anymore. One sensor is yeah quite easily handed. It um, has its values, has its um, information. But now we are getting like a big picture. 
a big picture where values may also not be consistent to each other. One sensor is telling you, like a temperature sensor is telling you there's going to be a problem. The other temperature sensor is telling you, yes, anything is OK. So who do you trust? Building up trust models because uh, all these sensors have, have their failures, have their wrong values, have uh, measurement or may have measurement problems. So you need to uh, consolidate all this information into one um, picture, acting like a human brain. So when you get information, right, like right now, you have uh, a lot of senses. Your ears are hearing something, your eyes are seeing something, your temperature senses are getting something, your pressure uh, sensors sitting down getting something. And what we do very automatically, what we sometimes even don't realize that we are doing, like collecting this information together to like, I'm feeling well, or I'm feeling not well, or what am I going to do? The, uh, to do this in, in computers, to learn them, is a very big task, especially if you want to do it now, if you don't trust or don't want to wait for all this uh, cool stuff that is announced, all the big artificial intelligence system, neuron neuronal computing, and so on. Yes, sure, they are coming, they're helping, but we're needing solutions right now. So, yeah, we're trying to do our best to get this out. And, yeah, one more, one last point is like, um, what's going to be the future besides the neuronal computing I was talking about? A very big topic we have is the so-called digital twins. So if you have uh, all the sensor information and the information about uh, like a rail cargo wagon, the next step is to connect these two together, have a model how this rail wagon is built, like w of built of which parts, how they are connected together using all the construction information, and having the information the sensors are delivering back and matching these two together. So this allows to like, get a more real-time picture of what is happening in one wagon, on the one hand, and also to do simulation. Simulation to get out of, uh, to give you decision support. So, for example, to give you, uh, oh, for example, to give you an example, um, one problem rail cargo typically has is that sometimes brakes can get very hot. If brakes get very hot, the problem is that you have to take this one wagon out that is generating this hot break. Meaning, you're somewhere in Europe, you're having a cargo, rail cargo train of 40 or 50 wagons, it's quite long. So first of all, you need to find a railway station that has enough capability to handle this train, have to go there. Then you have to find a, a provider that can do the shunting, can uh, like open up the train, get this one wagon out, um, close the train again, and then you're ready to go, go on with your, with your train. Means usually four hours, six hours, eight hours uh, is a delay that can happen very fast in that way. A delay that is not acceptable for the customer, of course. So. Where we want to go is, yeah, for example, this, the temperature sensors are indicating that a problem is going to come. Temperatures are rising. And with the information of what is going to happen on the one side, and also the geographical information, we're going to try to find um, a decision. A decision because it makes a difference. Uh, okay, if a break is getting a little bit warmer and I'm somewhere in Hungary, 300 kilometers of flat land ahead of me, uh, as a lock driver, I will be more relaxed than uh, when my brakes are getting hot and I'm going down an, an alpine uh, slope. So, what we are doing or where we want to go is that with this information, we are building a simulation. Also simulating the options, so for example, driving with different settings, different accelerations, or driving different tracks, and delivering this information back to the train driver, so that we're not just raising the concern, okay, brake temperature is going up, but also indicating uh, we, are, um, we tell you to uh, go in another mode, then you will uh, have the chance to go to the next big station and there we already planned ahead that there is something happening, that perhaps some parts are changed or that something is, is being done. So 
yeah, that rounds up what we at ÖBB are concerned with right now. We're uh, having like 100 wagons out in the wild now where we're testing different uh, sensors, like sensors ranging from uh, measuring acceleration, position in a simple way, up to those who are really like um, monitoring the health of the wagon or monitoring the health of the load. And also um, sensors that are like connecting to different sensors because when we're going with containers, these containers are already equipped with sensors by the container providers. So we are not just uh, interested in our information, but also in the information of what's going on inside and also trying to match these two because uh, um, something that is going on on the one hand can indicate a problem on the other hand. Yeah, so for developers, I think it's a IoT doing it right now, not waiting for all the big things announced. It's a very demanding thing, very demanding because this information is uh, running uh, in, in big masses. So, of course, we are using big data platforms, Hadoop, uh, Spark, and all the usual suspects to handle this data. But the most critical thing is um, finding ways how to get information or to get insight out of this data. Generating data is easy, as you have seen. Uh, sensors like uh, the, the ones we're using are in the range of some hundred euros. So even those that are withstanding all the conditions a rail car can have, like has to function with uh, sun shine and 40 degrees, has to function on heavy rain, has to function in a thunderstorm, has to function also in, in winter weather. So it's not that expensive to get the data, but what you're doing with it and how you're dealing with it is making the difference and also making the difference right now between the different rail operators in Europe. Everybody is equipping his cars with these things, but where the difference is, what do we learn out of it? So, yeah, if you're interested in um, doing the th these things, if that is a challenge for you that you think that might be interesting, yeah, I think we should have a, a talk afterwards at our booth where I can elaborate a little bit deeper, a little bit more on the specific topics we're having with uh, these things, where we are actually, what, where we're going the next steps, what steps Europe is going. Yeah, and so I hope I could give you a nice overview, a very uh, high-level overview of what IoT means for a company that is in production like railways. Railways is in production since decades already, and what that means, how that disrupts our business and uh, will generate some new ways how we're doing our business. Thank you. Us. Carol, many thanks. Um, there are now plenty of questions. Basically, you're crashing now the network, which is very nice of you. Um, somebody is coming from the air uh, flight industry, and that's heavily regulated. And he was wondering, how difficult is it to install IoT devices on trains? Are oh. there any regulations, any yeah. limitations? I'd say it's comparable to the airline industry. We also need a lot of uh, regulations, certifications. But uh, the, the thing we have is that in, in railways, on some parts, the, the way how it's regulated or how it's certified is not dealt out, dealt out yet. So even the regulators are, are learning how to do that and how to deal with all the, the topics. But yes, uh, a lot of regulations apply already. So you're not allowed to simply mount anything on a wagon you want to. So when you have mounted them, how many did you lose? Um, until now, we're happy to not, lose not too many. So they're not, or usually not, uh, mounted so um, publicly that it's interesting to like steal them. So they are heavily mounted with because like rail cars are used in very heavy equipment in like a steel industry or, or uh, other producing industries. So that is really a, a concern to mount them and to make them as robust to withstand these circumstances. Great. And how do they communicate? Which technology do you use to transfer data to your uh, data centers? Yeah, we are 
like uh, in investigation there right now, on the one hand using uh, GSM uh, networks, um, on the one hand direct networks to provide us, on the other hand uh, localized networks where the sensors are transmitting their information to a locomotive that is equipped with some other connectivity and also evaluating other technologies like uh, LoRa, LoRaWAN, if they are suitable to help us, especially in, in those regions, in rur rural regions where we have no connectivity or also in places uh, like in Austria, we have a lot of tunnels, so the connectivity there is also quite bad. So there we are in the process of finding our bunch of technologies that can help us. Thank you. Uh, one more question. How do you test your sensors? Do you have a special test track to get data about it before you go on the road? Um, that's, I'd say, one, one output of the trials we did already, that if we want to do, if we want to use the sensors in a, a, in a bigger variety and uh, use it them more exactly, that we have to do some, uh, on the one hand, uh, some test bench and also get some correction curves out or some uh, values how far or how long a sensor is reliable, because like temperature sensors, we know from some, from some sensors, they're very exact up to like 40 degrees, but if the temperature, temperatures are rising above that, then these, these sensors are get, simply getting unreliable and delivering more or less uh, uh, useless data, because it yeah, has no meaning anymore. And we, we need to get out this uh, information to do the correction, to do all the, um, yeah. Like generally said, um, doing the data correction, doing the data cleansing is a, a also, besides the modeling and the cool part getting insights out, is a very big uh, task in all these things to cleanse the data, to relate it to each other and not to lose the signal that's that is encoded in the data. Thank you. Somebody is curious about the tools you're using. Are you, can you share a little bit which monitoring tools, which kind of software you're using? Um, on the analysis side, we are using, I'd say, the, the typical uh, Hadoop stack. So we are having a Hadoop cluster, having uh, Kafka queues as, as ingestion, using Spark, Spark Machine Learning, R, NIME, and a bunch of tools to get our information out. And yeah, a lot of, of right now a lot of hand coded uh, tools, but we're uh, also in like uh, evaluating how can the different vendors, the different tools that are coming up market help us. So yeah, it's, it's more, th that's why I think it's interesting for developers. It's a place where, um, uh, where the tools of trade are not set yet for us. So it, we are very open if there are new things, if there are interesting APIs, interesting stuff, then we are testing it and including it. And I'm sure we are only on the beginning of the way and not on the end. Thank you. One final question, because you're using a lot of Lego in your presentation, mm -hmm. so somebody is asking, do you have a Lego department? And uh, do you need support? <laughs> somebody wants to apply for that. Um, no, unfortunately, no. Uh, the Lego is um, one thing we used because the, like, the big rail cargo wagons are quite a bit unhandy to demonstrate. And yeah, if we would have the opportunity, if we would have some more place, we would even have tried it today. Um, but it's a, a way also to, to demonstrate that, th that things are really working because yeah, when I'm showing you some slides, you can believe me that these curves are coming out or not. But when the train is driving and um, is ha having some problems and uh, the data shows immediately up, it's much more convin convincing, especially for people that are not like developers, people that are not so, know, uh, so near to what IoT, what all this new stuff is about. And so they really can believe better, believe us better what we're doing and uh, what we're promising. Thank you, Gerald. Big applause for Gerald. Thank you. Thank you.